الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So this uh, third topic for today, insha'Allah ta'ala, is about preparing for the soul's final journey. In the hadith of Abi Hurairah, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَادِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ Or he said, أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَادِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ you should frequently remember the destroyer of pleasures. Frequently remember what is going to destroy every single pleasurable thing you have in this world. And that is death. And Allah describes death with the word yaqeen. وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Worship your Lord until certainty comes to you. And the meaning of certainty here is death. Because death is what is certain, right? Every single one of us is going to taste death. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every single soul is going to taste death. In order to prepare for this journey, the first thing that we have to do is we have to understand this journey. And this journey, it begins with the moment of death. And that's why the scholars, when they talk about Kitab al-Iman, the chapters related to Iman, and they talk about al-Imanu bil yawmil akhir, Iman in the last day, Iman in the last day, it begins with the moment of death. And this moment of death is described in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal describes to us, وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ تَحِيدٍ the pains of death or the intoxication of death. You know, Allah Azza wa describes it as sekrah. The word sekrah, in this word in itself, means to be intoxicated, right? We say someone is sekran, and they are drunk. Allah describes death as sekratul maut, the intoxication of death. That is what you are trying to avoid. And in reality, almost everyone on the face of this earth is trying to avoid or delay the moment of death. وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ The moment of death and this intoxication of death, it has come in truth. This is what you are trying to avoid. So once we have understood that death is something that every single person has to go through. And we have understood that we must prepare for it. Like the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to his companions, for something like this, for this kind of thing, you should prepare yourself for iddu. Prepare yourselves for this, a day like this. And that's why in reality, subhanAllah, we see that many, many people, one of the worst things that can happen to a person is that they are unaware of death. And that's why we talk about sudden death. When a person dies without preparation or without thought. You know, like somebody, for example, think about the difference between somebody who dies 
from, let's say, a long-term cancer versus somebody who dies suddenly in a car crash. Of course, if they are Muslim, both of them should have been prepared for death. But we're just talking about on the general human level now. You have someone who dies from a long-term cancer. For the last two years, the doctor has been saying, you only have this many months left to live. Maybe you only have this long left to live. It's spreading in your body. Maybe you only have this long left to live. The person is prepared for death and they're ready for it. They already thought about what's going to happen. They thought about what they're going to say to their family. They thought about their inheritance. They thought about leaving this world. They thought about the hereafter. Whether they are Muslim or not, all of those things went through their head because they were prepared to die. And that's why sometimes people come to me and they say to me that, Akhi Muhammad, you know, I've had a, I've got, I'm sick. The doctor's given me a diagnosis and he told me that I don't have very long left to live. And sometimes I say, Akhi, wallahi, I know you're going to be shocked when I say this, but I'm going to say to you that Allah has given you a ni'mah he hasn't given to many people. Allah Azza wa Jal has told you to prepare for death. And many, many people are not prepared. And then I tell them, Yahi, the doctor doesn't know you're going to live for six months, six years, or six days, or six hours. Because it's not in the hand of the doctor, it's in the hands of Allah. But see the blessing in it. The blessing of knowing that your death is coming. And so you prepare for it. We as Muslims should be like that person by default. That should be our basic way that we approach our life. That we are actually ready for death. And I want to ask yourself, before we talk about the long hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib and the moment of death and so on, I just want to ask yourself a question. If you died today, if you died today, what would happen? I don't mean about any, anything specific generally. What do you think would happen to you? What kind of a condition are you in in terms of your practicing of Islam and the sins you have? What would happen to your family? What kind of condition are they in? Are they ready? Are you prepared for the moment when you're going to die? The moment you die, let's say you die tonight. What happens next? Where are you in terms of your good deeds, your bad deeds, the haram that you were going to leave next week, the things you were going to do tomorrow, and I was going to memorize the Quran next year? And I'm, what happens if you die tonight? What happens? What will happen to you? You can't answer that question in a definitive way, but just think about it. Think about what would happen to your family. Have you got a wasiyah? Have you prepared an advice and a will for the family as to what will happen to you and what will happen to your property? Who is, have you given responsibility for, for the people that you leave behind? Where do they even start? Well, many of us, we are so unprepared. We are not prepared neither for the akhirah nor for the consequences of death in the dunya. Meaning, nor are we prepared for questioning in the grave and being questioned by Allah and answering for what we do. And we're also not prepared from a dunya perspective. Our families are not prepared. We have no idea what will happen the moment you die. Who is going to do what? What's the next step? Who is going to take care of what aspect? There's no plan. Because most of us live this life thinking that we are not going to die. Not going to die, not today, not tomorrow, not the next day. Whereas the Muslim who is intelligent is the one who is constantly prepared for death. The person who, it's, it doesn't mean that I'm going to die today. I might. But I'm ready. Should I die today, I have the best preparation that I could do. Of course, I'm going to meet Allah with sins like the mountains. I know that. But as much tawbah as I could have made, as much good as I could have taken out of today, as much preparation, as much prayer, as much dhikr, as much as I could do, as much istighfar as I could do, as whatever I could do, I am as ready as I could be. And then you ask yourself with regard to family. So there's a wasiyah. The family know what to do. If something happens, this is your first step. 
This is your next step. This is what needs to be done for preparing the body. This is what needs to be done for the janazah. For example, the other day, I was asked a question. If you die in a far off place, would you want your body to be transported near to your family? And I immediately said, no. If I die in a place where there is a maqbara of the Muslims, there is a cemetery where Muslims are buried, bury me in the place that nearest maqbara to where I die. And don't delay the burial waiting for the people to come or waiting for this to happen. If you have some people to pray over me, just find a Muslim cemetery and bury me there and let whoever is there pray over me. And whoever comes late, they can come and pray the janazah after that. But a lot of people never answer this question. And that's why when someone dies, the family is in a state, yani hayran, they're in a state of confusion and loss. Like, what do we do? Does he want this? Does he want that? What happens to the money? What happens to the house? What do we do next? Where is the money? What, how do we pay the bills at the end of the month? The person didn't prepare. La fit dunya wa la fit akhirah. Not for that which relates to the dunya and not for that which relates to the akhirah. So preparing for death is something that we should have in our mind and always the question you ask yourself is the question that Allah poses to you. Ya ayuhalladheena amanu taqullaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad. All you who believe have taqwa of Allah and let everybody look what did you put forward for tomorrow? What's going to happen to you if you die today? And like I said nobody can answer that question with certainty. Only you can just I mean, look at what you see and try to improve what you see and try to get rid of some of the haram that you see. So preparing for death, remembering that you're going to die. And there's a principle I'm going to mention to you. The principle is not a hadith per se. Like some of the meanings of it are narrated in some of that hadith, but it's not a hadith in itself. And this is the statement, whoever lives doing something will die upon it. This is not narrated like that in the hadith. It's not mentioned like that exactly, but the meaning of it is found within various ahadith. That if you live doing something, you will die upon it bi ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jal writes for you the rewards of what you did when you were healthy. So there's no point saying, okay, today I become sick. And that sickness gets worse and worse and worse until I die. What will be written for me? The worship that I did today. What I did today to worship Allah will be written for me all the days until I die. So if I'm not having a good day worshipping Allah today, that's bad for me because it means that the things that I am doing today when I'm healthy, when I become sick the next day, and then eventually the sickness progresses until death, Allah Azza wa Jal commands the angels to write the worship that I did as a habit. What was my habitual worship, my day-to-day -day worship, Allah Azza wa Jal writes that for the person. So it's very important. Right now you have your health, you have some time, you have, for many of us, youth in varying degrees. Some of us are older than others. But you have time. So use it today because that's what's going to be written for you. And that's the meaning of the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. Take benefit of five before five. This hadith is a profound hadith. Take benefit of five things before five things happen. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned, Shababaka qabla haramik. Take advantage of your youth before you become old. And take advantage of the time that you are young before you become old. And take advantage of Take advantage of your youth before you become old. And take advantage of your wealth before you become poor. 
غناك قبل فقرك Take advantage of your wealth before you become poor. Take advantage of your health before you become sick. صحتك قبل مرضك Take advantage of your health before you become sick. Take advantage of your free time. وفراغك قبل شغرك Take advantage of your free time before you become busy. وَحَيَاتَكَ قَبْلَ مَوْتِكَ And take advantage of your life before you die. So if a person takes advantage of their youth before they become old, and their health before they become sick, and their wealth before they become poor, and their free time before they become busy, and their life before their death. And ultimately the last one is like a description of all the other four. So a person who takes care of their youth and their health and their wealth and their free time is the person who took care of their life before they died. So a person always needs to take advantage of these things before the time comes when these things are taken away. And there are many examples of that in the hadith, the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, بَادِرُ بِالْأَعْمَالِ فِتَنًا Rush to do good deeds before trials and tribulations come. Taking advantage of now before tomorrow comes. So if we're going to talk about the beginning of the soul's journey, the beginning of the soul's journey is Sakratul Maut. The moment of death. This moment of death, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti la sakarat. He said, La ilaha illallah, there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. Indeed, death has its stupor, like they say, yani its intoxication, the pains of death. As for the believer, what are these pains? They are mukaffirat al dhunub. They're the things that make your sins go away. And you have those sins left in the moment before you die. And Allah Azza wa Jal makes those sins go away from you by Sakratul Maut, the pains of death. And the pains of sickness that precede death. And Allah Azza wa Jal, for some people like the Prophets and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, it was a way to raise their level. And the Prophet وسلم, his sins were forgiven in any case. But Allah Azza wa Jal raised his level by this sickness that he felt, this Sakratul Maut. Allah Azza wa Jal continued to raise his status in the sight of Allah by it. So you gain good deeds and you lose sins. There are some people who don't feel it, like the one who is shaheed, the one who is martyred for the sake of Allah, doesn't feel Sakratul Maut. They don't feel the pangs of death. For those who are shaheed, in a way that the Sharia tells them to be. Not yani, these days, yani, anybody who dies, any Shaheed, and this guy who dies doing haram is Shaheed, and the guy who dies killing people is Shaheed, and everybody is Shaheed. Yani. But it's very important. The Shahada which is accepted by Allah is the Shahada in accordance with the Sunnah. If your action is not in accordance with the Sunnah, it's not going to be accepted. And there are two types of shaheed, of course, right? There is shaheed al ma'arika the one who dies in the battlefield, and there is the one who dies in another circumstance, but the Prophet ﷺ said, for example, man qutila duna malihi fahuwa shaheed, whoever is killed defending his wealth is a shaheed. So this one is different from that one. But the one who dies on the battlefield, they don't feel sakratul maut, the pangs of death any in general, and Allah knows best. After that comes the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib radiyallahu an. Al-Bara ibn Azib radiyallahu an. He said, خَرَجْنَا مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. We went out with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم for the janaza of a man from the Ansar. We went for his funeral. A man from the Ansar, the people of Medina, died and we went out for his janaza. He said, فَانْتَهَيْنَا إِلَى الْقَبْرِ وَلَمَّا يُلْحَدْ 
We came to the grave and the person had not been placed into the lahd. Yani the, the body hadn't been put into the grave. He said, فَجَلَسَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَجَلَسْنَا حَوْلَهِ He said, we sat down with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and we sat around him as though there were birds on our heads. كَأَنَّمَا عَلَى رُؤُوسِنَا الطَّيْرِ Yani like they were sat so still, still. وَفِي يَدِهِ عُودٌ And in the hand of the Prophet ﷺ was a stick. He was scratching the earth with it. فَرَفَعَ رَأْسَهُ He raised his head. فَقَالْ إِسْتَعِيذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ He said, ask Allah's refuge or seek Allah's refuge from the punishment of the grave. مَرَّتَيْنِ أَوْ ثَلَاثًا He said it twice or he said it three times. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what happens to the believing soul and what happens to the disbelieving soul? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us about the believing soul in the moment of death. He told the companions in this hadith about the believing soul and that believing soul, what happens to it? at the moment of death and when it's about to leave this world angels come and these angels they have faces that are bright like the sun when the person believing soul is about to leave this world and to face the akhirah angels come from the heavens and they have white faces like their faces are bright like the sun. And with them they have a shroud from the shrouds of paradise. Kafanun min akthanil jannah. They have a shroud from the shroud of paradise. And they have perfume from the perfume of paradise or fragrance from the fragrance of paradise. And those angels, they sit as far as the eye can see. Then the angel of death comes. Then the angel of death comes. Until he sits at the head of the person. And he says, O soul which is good. And he, oh good soul. And content soul. Come out. Come out. أُخْرُجِي إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٍ Come out to forgiveness from Allah and His pleasure. And the soul comes out like a drop falls from the lip of a water vessel. So how you would have like a water, like say for example a glass of water, how a drop flows down the side of the glass. You know when you drank and there's a little drop and it just goes, slides down the side of the glass. That's how the soul comes out. And those angels, they take it. They take it. The angels take it. And those angels, they don't leave it in the hand of the angel of death. Even for the blink of an eye, they don't leave that soul in the hands of the angel of death for even the blink of an eye. They put it into that kefen, into that shroud. And they put it with this yani, uh, fragrance. And this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. تَوَفَّتْهُ رُسُلُنَا وَهُمْ لَا يُفَرِّطُونَ Our messengers cause, or cause it to die or responsible for its death. And they do not, وَهُمْ لَا يُفَرِّطُونَ They do not fall short in what they've been given as a job. And there comes from it a smell like the smell of the most beautiful musk on the face of the earth. And so they begin to ascend. 
and they do not go by any group of angels except the angels say, Who is this person with this beautiful soul? They say, Fulanun, they say, Fulan ibn Fulan. He is so and so, the son of so and so, by the best names that he's known by in this dunya. Until they finish and they reach the lowest heavens. And they reach the first heaven. So they've taken this soul all the way up into the heavens. And they reach the lowest heaven. They ask for it to be opened for this soul. And it's open for them. And they go by every single heaven. From one to the next. Then Allah Azza wa Jal commands when they reach the last heaven. Then they reach the seventh heaven. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, Write the name of my soul in Illiyin. I'm going to tell you something scary about Illiyin and about Sijin. You know what Allah said about both of those two things in the Quran, right? What's the thing Allah said about both of them after He mentioned Inna Kitab al Abarar? Lafi Illiyin. Inna Kitab al Fujari Lafi Sijin. What did Allah Azza wa Jalla say about both of them? Kitabun Marqum. It is a decree that has already been written. Kitabun Marqum. Your book, your it's already been it is been written for you. But Subhanallah, without the help of Allah Azza wa Jalla, you will not be able to be from that person who is that believing soul, unless Allah Subhanahu wa Taala helps you and unless Allah has mercy on you. So seek that help from Allah and work hard for it. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Those people who strive for us, we will guide them to our ways. So this person, their name is written in Illiyin. Some of the scholars said Illiyin is a place. Some of them said it's a place where the book is. Some of them said it's the name of the book. But in any case, the soul is written in Illiyin. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla says, or it is said, أَعِيدُوهُ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ Bring him back to the earth. For Allah says, مِنْهَا خَلَقْتُهُمْ وَفِيهَا عُعِيدُهُمْ وَمِنْهَا أُخْرِجُهُمْ Like this is mentioned in the hadith. تَارَةً أُخْرَى And he's like the ayah in surah uh, Taha. مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى From this earth we created them and to it we will return them and from it, we will bring them out one more time. فَيُرَدُّ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ The person goes back to the earth. وَتُعَادُ رُوحُهُ فِي جَسَدِهِ And the soul goes into the body. And then he sees, فَإِنَّهُ يَسْمَعُ He hears the sound of the footsteps of the sandals of his people as they walk away from the grave. You imagine this, they've buried him, they've shrouded, they've washed the body, They've wrapped it, they've put the body in the grave, they've covered the soil, they've said what they're going to say, and now they walk away. And maybe the last people to walk away are the relatives, right? The last people to walk away, the closest relatives of the dead person. And finally, that's it. We, sh we washed him, we shrouded him, we buried him, we made dua for him. Allahumma ghfir lahu wa thabithu, Allah forgive him and make him firm. And then we walked away. And when the, when the soul is returned to the body, the last thing that this dead person hears is the sound of the sandals of the people walking away from his grave. And then what happens? Then there comes to him, فَيَأْتِيهِ malakan, Two angels, which are extremely and terrifying. And they shake him and force him to sit. They say to him, who is your Lord? Now imagine the only thing you hear is you've just heard the footsteps of your relatives leave you and now you're in this space. 
and suddenly two fearsome angels come and force you to sit. And the first thing they ask you is, Marrabbuk, who is your Lord? So this believing soul, what does he say? فَيَقُولُ رَبِّيَ Allah, My Lord is Allah. Then they say to him, مَا دِينُكَ What is your religion? فَيَقُولُ دِينِي Islam. He says, my religion is Islam. And they say to him, وَمَا هَذَا الرَّجُلَ الَّذِي بُعِثَ فِيكُمْ Who was this man sent among you? Why do the narrations mention it like this? They don't say, who is your prophet? So the person doesn't say, oh, prophet? Yeah, prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is this man? Who is this man? أَمْ لَمْ يَعْرِفُوا رَسُولَهُمْ Is it that they don't know who their messenger is? فَهُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ So then they reject him. Who is this man that was sent among you? He says, هُوَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ This is the messenger of Allah صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ They say to him, مَا عَمَلُكْ What did you do with your life? He says, قَرَأْتُ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ فَآمَنْتُ بِهِ وَصَدَّقْتُ He says, I read the book of Allah, I believed in it, and I held it to be true. And it's said that they repeat, in some of the narrations it's mentioned that they repeat it again. مَن نَبِيُّكَ who is your Lord and what is your religion and who is your Prophet? And then the Prophet وسلم, linked this to the statement of Allah يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Allah makes firm those who believe with a firm word in this life and in the next. So once again he says, my Lord is Allah and my religion is Islam and my Prophet is Muhammad وسلم, until a voice cries out from the heavens and Sadaqa Abdi, my slave told the truth. فَأَفْرِشُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَلْبِسُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَافْتَحُوا لَهُ بَابًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Make his bed a bed from Jannah. And make his clothing the clothing of Jannah. And open to him a door to Jannah. Yani a door that allows the, the fragrance and the, the environment of Jannah to come into his grave. So then he can smell the fragrance of it, the gentle any wind of it, the, the, the breeze blows upon him and the fragrance of Jannah. Then his grave is made as wide as his eye can see. So from it doesn't become like this small space. It becomes so wide that as far as his eye can see, he can only see the space that he's resting in. And in his grave. Then there comes to him a man. Rajulun Hasanul Waj, with a really handsome face. Hasanul Thiyab, with nice clothing. Tayyibul Rih, with a nice fragrance. And it said to him, Abshir. Abshir bil ladi yasurruk. Take glad tidings of that which makes you happy. Abshir bi ridwanin min Allah wa jannatin fiha na'imun muqeem. Take glad tidings of Allah's pleasure and a paradise that there is everlasting pleasure in it. Hada yawmukul ladhi kunta tu'ad. This is the day that you were promised. So he says, who are you? He says, may Allah give you good. Who are you? Your face is like a face of someone who's bringing good news to me. He says, Ana amaluk as -salih. I'm the righteous deeds that you did. He said, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا عَلِمْتُكَ إِلَّا كُنْتَ سَرِيعًا فِي طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ بَطِيئًا فِي مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ He says, I know you that you were fast to obey Allah and you were slow to disobey Allah. Then a door is opened to him from Jannah and a door from the fire. And it's said to him, this is your place in the fire if you disobeyed Allah. But Allah has replaced that place for you with a better place. 
and he shows him, he sees his place in the hellfire. That is the place that Allah had put for you in Jahannam. But Allah has replaced it with a better place. And when he sees his place in Jannah, he says, Rabbi aqim sa'a. My Lord, make the hour come quickly. My Lord, make the hour come quickly. As for the disbelieving slave, when he's about to leave this world and about to face the Akhirah, there come down angels who are ghilavun shidat, severe and harsh. Their faces are dark. They have with them, they have with them a sackcloth from hellfire. They sit around him as far as the eye can see. Then there comes the angel of death and the angel of death sits at his hand and says, nafsul khabisa, O evil, filthy soul, Ukhruji ila sakhatim min Allahi wa ghadab. Come out from Al to Allah's anger and fury. Allah is furious and Allah is angry with you. Come out to Allah's wrath and Allah's anger. فَتَفَرَّقَ فِي جَسَدِهِ and then the soul, it tries to split through the body. It tries to escape through every part of the body. And the angel rips it out like a skewer is ripped through wet wool. Imagine if you had a sharp skewer with many like sharp pieces on it. And you had it wrapped around a piece of wet wool and you ripped the skewer out. All the wool rips the whole body inside, the veins, the nerves. It said, فَتُقُطِّعَ or, or, uh, يعني, It said that what happens is that the, the, the veins and the nerves break apart. And the scream is heard by every angel between the heavens and the earth and as for the angels in the heavens the doors of the heavens are closed and the person doesn't find a single door by which to reach the heavens and every time they pass by an angel the angels say who is this evil soul it is so and so the son of so and so and they call him by the worst names that he's known in this world until he comes to the sama dunya the lowest heaven and it's فَيُسْتَفْتَحُ بِهِ It's said, can he enter to go to the highest heaven to have his name recorded? فَلَا يُفْتَحُ لَهُ It's not open for him. Then the Messenger وسلم, recited the ayah. لَا تُفَتَّحُ لَهُمْ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ وَلَا يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ حَتَّى يَلِجَ الْجَمَلُ فِي سَمِّ الْخِيَاطِ Those people, the door of the heavens will never be open for them. And they will never enter Jannah until the camel goes through the eye of a needle. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Uktubu kitabahu fi sijin. Write his name in sijin, in the lowest part of the earth. Fil ardi sufla, in the lowest part of the earth. Then Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Aidu abdi ila al ard. Return my servant to the earth. And once again, minha khalaqtuhum. وَفِيهَا أُعِيدُهُمْ وَمِنْهَا أُخْرِجُهُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى It's from the earth that I created them and it's to the earth that I return them and it's from the earth I will bring them forth one more time. So do the angels carry the soul down to the body? They don't. They cast down the soul from the highest place. Okay, from, the top, from the lowest heaven, yani the highest place. Remember the lowest heaven is covered by stars. And in the place of the stars, they throw the soul down to the earth. They just throw it. And they let it fall. <laughs> Until the soul smashes into the body. And the Prophet ﷺ, he recited, Whoever makes a partner with Allah, it's as though they were thrown from the heavens. So the birds snatch them or the wind carries them to a far off place. Then the soul is put back into the body. 
and the person hears the footsteps of their relatives walk away from the grave. Then the two angels come who are severe in their nature and they shake him and they make him sit up and they say to him, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? Fayaqulu ha ha la adri. This word ha is a word that you say when you know something but you can't bring it out. It's like what you say when you know the answer to something but the answer doesn't come. Like you know it, you, you know it's, it's, it's there, but you just, you can't bring yourself to say it. I, I, I don't know. He says, I don't know. Now the question is, did he not know that Allah was his Lord? Of course he did. And he, almost every single individual on this earth, certainly the majority of the kuffar, they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their Lord. The issue is they don't worship him or they don't enter into his religion, but they know that, that, that Allah is my Lord. But now in this moment where he's desperate to bring the answer, Allah doesn't let him say the answer. He can't bring it. It's like, I know, I, I know the answer to this question, but I, I don't know. He can't say it until he says, I don't know. Because his doubts and his lack of conviction, now they come out. Before it didn't come out. Maybe before if you asked, you know, if there's a life after death and you get questioned, who is your Lord? What will you say? You say, Allah. If they are asked who created the heavens and the earth, they say, Allah. But in the grave, in that moment, he can't answer it. And that's why he says, Ha. Like, I, I've, it, I know he's stuttering, he's trying to say it, but he can't say it. And that's why some of the narrations mention فَلَا يَهْتَدِي لِسْمِهِ He's not guided to be able to say Allah's name. Or after that, it's when he's asked about the Prophet فَلَا يَهْتَدِي لِسْمِهِ He's not able to be able to say the Prophet's name. So again, he's asked, وَمَا دِينُكُ What's your religion? He says, ha, ha, la ad. I don't know. Then it said to him, what do you say about this man that was sent to you? He can't say his name. He can't say the name of the Prophet ﷺ. It is said to him, Muhammad. He says, I don't know. This is powerful. He says, I heard the people saying something and I said it. And there's many possibilities. The munafiq heard the people saying so, he said. But many people in their false religion, they're just following what they heard somebody else say. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal blamed them for the taqlid, that is the taqlid in the issues of i'tiqat. Following people blindly in the matters of belief. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا If it's said to them, follow what Allah revealed, they say, I follow what my father used to do. أَوَلَوْ كَانَ آبَاؤُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِنُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ Even though their fathers didn't understand anything and were not guided. So when they blindly followed their fathers, and they blindly followed what other people said, he admits in the grave, I heard people say something and I just said what people said. Many people like this, even in Islam, when you ask them, why are you a Muslim? What does Islam mean to you? I heard people say, La ilaha illallah, so I said it. And the person doesn't understand. So this is very important. This is from the many evidences that you must understand your religion for yourself, especially al-i'tiqad, the beliefs in Allah, the beliefs in Iman, the Iman, you must understand it for yourself. You must not be someone who says, I heard my dad say to me, I'm a Muslim, so I'm a Muslim. Or I heard people say the Prophet Muhammad is true, but I don't even know who he was. Because in the grave it will come out. Then a caller calls from the heavens, Ankadaba Abdi or Ankadaba in some narrations. 
that my slave has lied. فَأَفْرِشُوا لَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ وَافْتَحُوا لَهُ بَابًا إِلَى النَّارِ So prepare for him a bed of fire and open for him a door from the fire. So the heat and the poison of the fire comes out. And his grave, وَيُضَيَّقُ عَلَيْهِ قَبْرُهُ His grave is made so constricted that his ribs crush against each other. His ribs go into each other. Then a man comes, قَبِيحُ الْوَجْ With an evil face, an ugly face. قَبِيحُ thiab, Ugly clothes. He has a horrible smell. And he says, أَبْشِرْ بِالَّذِي يَسُوءُكْ Take the tidings of what is going to make you, يعني make you sad or make you feel terrible. This is the day you are promised. He says, you may Allah give you evil. What have you brought? Who are you? Your face is a face that looks like you've come with evil. He says, Ana amalk al I am your evil deeds. فَوَاللَّهِ مَا عَلِمْتُ إِلَّا كُنْتَ بَطِيئًا عَنْ طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ سَرِيعًا إِلَى مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ For by Allah, I knew that you are slow to obey Allah and quick to disobey Allah. فَجَزَاكَ اللَّهُ شَرَّ So may Allah give you evil. Then this person, he is struck. He struck a striking that every that makes the earth shudder and everything on the heavens and the earth hears it except the human being. And he struck so hard that he screams a scream that everything hears it except a human being. Why? Because the Prophet said, Lawla an la tadafanu. If it were not for the fact that you would not bury your dead. I would have made dua for Allah to make you hear something of the punishment of the grave. Everyone hears it except the human being and the jinn. Then a door from the fire is open and a bed of fire is made for him. And what does he say in this? And I, to be honest with you, I believe this is one of the most profound parts of the hadith. This, he's just been beaten, at least some of the narrations mentioned twice or more. He's been beaten with a he's been beaten with a beating that made the whole everything in the heavens and the earth heard his scream, except the human beings and the jinn. And he's been burnt with fire, and he's lying on a bed of fire with clothing from fire. His ribs are crushed against themselves. The poison of Jahannam is coming into his mouth and his nose. The door of Jahannam, he can see Jahannam from his grave. What does he ask Allah for? He asks Allah, oh Allah, let me stay here. That's the most profound thing. He begs Allah to let him stay there. Rabbi la tuqim My Lord, allow me to stay here. Don't make the day of judgment come. Because he knows what is coming is worse and worse and worse. Could you imagine someone in that state, in that pain, in that suffering, and he's making dua, Ya Allah, let me stay in my place. I don't leave. I want to stay here. I, I, want, I want to be here. That's something to think about. It's a profound, wallahi, very, very profound. That a person in that situation, in that level of torture and punishment, is begging Allah to let them stay. Because they know that every single thing that's coming to them after that is worse and worse and worse. Tayyip, what is mentioned here is the kafir. In some of the narrations it's mentioned, al-fajir, and the, the wicked person. But in reality, what happens to the disobedient Muslim? I believe that the stronger opinion here is that the disobedient Muslim is not mentioned in either of these two. Rather, the disobedient Muslim is left like that. So that you remain in fear and you don't know. 
because neither have you and I done the deeds to be like that righteous Muslim. And we hope that we don't end our life like that kafir. But we don't know where we sit in between those two things. And it's narrated. The Prophet ﷺ passed by two people who were Muslim. And he said, These two people are being punished, but they're not being punished for something people think is a major sin. As for one of them, he didn't used to keep himself clean when he went to the toilet. He didn't used to stop the urine from splashing upon his clothes. And as for the other one, he used to spread rumors between the people. And he made people dislike each other by saying he said and she said. But it's worth us to just take a moment to look at the reasons for the punishment of the grave or some of the reasons for the punishment of the grave and the reasons for being saved from the punishment of the grave. As we mentioned, one of them that is mentioned in the hadith is that the person doesn't keep themselves clean when going to the toilet. I'm sure, I don't know how this masjid is, but I'm really always shocked about our masjid in Newcastle when I go in Gateshead, that the bathrooms are in a terrible state. And he, there's a brother in our masjid in Gateshead, Allah bless him. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to give him the blessings of the grave because of what he does for keeping the masjid clean. Subhanallah, he cleans that bathroom how many times a day? And still you go inside of it, wallah, you see it is covered in najasat. And you say to the people, this is the Muslims who use the bathroom. They don't know how to use the bathroom properly. I don't know what they do. I don't know how it's even possible to make such a mess in the bathroom. And this bathroom is cleaned. And again, the brother will go clean it. Again, you go in an hour later, if it's busy, you go in an hour later, it's dirty again. People don't keep themselves clean and they don't pay attention to keeping themselves clean. The second thing is spreading a namima. Spreading what? Stories and rumors about people. Sometimes people do it innocently, but they're just always concerned with what other people are doing. They're always thinking about what other people are doing. Oh, you know that brother I saw, you know I heard about that brother. And just going back and forward, back and forward until people, and until people uh, start to dislike each other or hate each other because of what is being spread between the people. From those reasons to be punished in the grave is a person who doesn't pray with wudu, who prays without wudu. Who prays without wudu. And this happens to people. People are embarrassed. They break the wudu in the prayer. They don't go and make wudu again. I just finish my prayer and then I'll go. The person was punished in the grave. From this is that a person passed by an oppressed individual and didn't help them. And they saw someone being oppressed and they were able to do something and they didn't help them. Telling a lie that reaches the horizons. How many people do this? Telling a lie that reaches the horizons. Now, if you lie on social media, wallah, that lie reaches al-afaq, it reaches every country, every place. The one who reads the Qur'an, or who read the Qur'an, and then sleeps on it in the night and doesn't act upon it in the day. And he neither does he pray with it at night, nor does he act upon it in the day. The one who devours riba is also mentioned. The one who left giving the zakah. The one who devours haram. The one who devours riba, the one who eats from the wealth of the orphan. I mean, there are so many that are mentioned. The one who harms the Muslims.
all, I mean, there are literally, I have lists of, and I can see lists yani, of, of, and you can mention 70 reasons yani, that I mentioned within the hadith for the person or the people who are punished in the grave. In general, how do you summarize it? Every single sin a person does has a potential to be a reason to be punished in the grave. Every sin that a person does has a potential to be a reason why people are punished in the grave. And then there are specific reasons. Uh, I think I mentioned them at times before. And we mentioned yani, a lot of them. Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned a long list of them. And those people, and I wanted to mention this one particularly, from all the ones I wanted to mention, I wanted to mention this issue of rumors and telling lies that reach the horizon, and also harming other people's honor, and harming other people's reputation. Whether it's false rumors about them, whether it is exposing their sins, whatever it is, but a person who takes away from the honor of people, and who harms people's honor. The people who took from the war booty, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are many, many, many examples which are mentioned within the ahadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What about the reasons to be saved from the punishment of the grave? What about the reasons to be saved from the punishment of the grave? So again, what we would say is we would say that every single, we would say, that every single good deed that you do could be a reason to be saved from the punishment of the grave. I mean, every good deed you do could be considered to be a means to be saved, just like every sin could be a potential. So every good deed that you do could be a reason to be saved. But there are some things that are mentioned specifically. There are some things that are mentioned specifically. The first is making dua to Allah to save you from the punishment of the grave. The general dua, the Prophet ﷺ, since he was told about the punishment of the grave, he never stopped asking Allah to be saved from it. He never stopped asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his salah, before the end of the tashahhud, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnati al-mahiyya wal mamat wa min sharri fitnati al-masih al-tajjal From the reasons to be saved is to recite Tabaraka al-ladhi biyadihi al-mulk Tabaraka al-ladhi biyadihi al-mulk To recite Surah al-mulk Particularly reciting Surah Al-Mulk before you go to sleep and in some of the narrations Surah Al-Mulk and also Surah Al-Sajda before you go to sleep. The Prophet Sallallahu said about Surah Al-Mulk, It is the one that prevents and it is the one that saves. It saves a person from the punishment of the grave. By reciting it. There are some things that a person can't control. And it doesn't come in their hands. That save them from the punishment of the grave. That the one who dies from a disease of the stomach. The one who dies. Laylat al Jumu'ah. Or Yawm al Jumu'ah who dies on the day of Jumu'ah or the night before Jumu'ah, any Thursday night or a Friday. The person who dies for the sake of Allah, the martyr for the sake of Allah. And there are some that is not, and it might be, an, it might be something a person does, but it's not really possible for a person to, it might not be possible for a person to get that opportunity. Like, al-ribat, 
the person who guards the borders of the Muslim lands. The Prophet ﷺ said, every kullul mayyit, kullul mayyiti, every person, their deeds are sealed except for al-murabit. The one who guards the borderlands, the borders of the Muslim lands. This person's deeds are increased until yawm al-qiyamah and he will be saved from the fitna of the grave. These are some of the mentions or some of the things that uh, are mentioned with regard to being saved from the punishment of the grave. My point in all of this is we only just spoke about the punishment of the grave and we only spoke about it a little bit. But what my, my point in all of this was one thing. All of these points have things you can do now to prepare. That was my point in all of this. That's why I chose the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib instead of another hadith or instead of talking about Jannah. They, all of these things have things you can prepare right now. You can prepare. يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ If Allah makes you firm upon لا إله إلا الله in this world, then Allah Azza wa Jal will make you firm in answering those questions in the grave. But you have to live لا إله إلا الله. And لا إله إلا الله is not just something you say. لا إله إلا الله is something you live. A person, what did I say in the beginning? That a person who lives upon something dies upon it. You live all the time upon saying La ilaha illallah, upon asking Allah for safety, upon seeking refuge with Allah from the punishment of the grave and reciting Surah Al-Mulk. And you're doing, what, you're doing whatever you can. That person, inshaAllah ta'ala, is preparing for the soul's final journey. As for the person who doesn't do it, that person has not prepared. And also the person thinks about preparing in terms of the dunya, as we said, like the wasiyah, having a written their uh, instructions for what they do, what the people do after, or their advice for what people do when they die. And a person prepares their last will and testament about, especially if they have property they own or they have money, like a, a, a significant amount of money they earn, how should that be divided and what should it be done, what should be done with it? A person remembers frequently the destroyer of desires and they remember frequently their status in terms of where they are at at this moment in time in terms of good deeds and bad deeds. They remember the soul's final journey and because of that they take points of action. I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to try and do this and do this and do this. And by this inshallah ta'ala a person can prepare for that journey uh, there's a lot to talk about in this topic. I've got a couple of videos on it which are more detailed and a bit more organized. Uh, we have a video, something I think it's called something like if I die tonight or if you die tonight, something like that. Uh, and there's also a number of videos on the hereafter and the soul's journey and the uh, topic of death. So those have more detail than this one, but this is just again a summary and a reminder. هذا والله أعلم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We have a ten minute break. Okay.